anywhere. Shall we pray together? So Lord, may my mouth speak wisdom and the meditation of my heart bring understanding that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher this morning to awaken our hearts, expand our minds, and shape our identity in you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we began looking, didn't we, at this, what most Christians consider to be the most difficult book in the Bible, the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. And so if you haven't caught up yet, now's your opportunity to watch the video. And as part of last week's message, I I shared three of the most helpful things that I've learned about the book of Revelation, purely because I've found them helpful. It doesn't mean that you will, but I hope you will. And the first of those things was this, to know what the word revelation means. And of course, if you were here last week, you all now know what the word of revelation, what the word revelation means. But if you weren't, let me, and you're not sure, let me try and give you a bit of information. Firstly, it's singular, not plural. The amount of people who I hear who talk about the book of revelations, it is not. It is the book of revelation. The first three words in the book uh, in the Greek New Testament of the book of Revelation are these, Revelation, Jesus Christ. That word revelation is from a Greek word called apocalypsis. Two Greek words it's made up of, apo, away from, and calypsis, veil. The idea being the picture that we're meant to get from this book is to see something of a veil being removed or of an unveiling of this magnificent vision of Jesus Christ. It's a vision that's from Jesus Christ and it's about Jesus Christ. He's both the sender of the message and he's the center of the message. And I said I think it's helpful to to see and to hear and to experience this book of Revelation as if we can imagine ourselves going to see or to watch, or to hear a West End show. It's why if you weren't here last week, we're using this curtain. And we're pulling back this curtain each time as we look through various scenes, because it reveals, and to reveal an object of some type, or an image of some type, that gives us a picture either of what John's trying to say about Jesus, or what he's trying to say about the people that he's talking about. And so this week in Act 2, if you like, we're going to go to three scenes. We're going to pull back this curtain three times to see different objects, different images that might be important to help us understand this passage. And as we go through this passage, what we'll see is that for some, it might be a familiar holiday destination. The Aegean Sea and what is now modern day Turkey. So here's scene one, if you like, as we, as we pull back the curtain once more. And as we pull back the curtain once more, we're on, this time, Patmos. Anyone been to Patmos? There's a couple of people have been. There's two people in our church at the moment who are on Patmos at this very time. It's a rocky island similar in size to Jersey. And there we hear that the writer of this book, John, is is living there in exile. He's been banished there. And John is writing to seven churches in what is now modern-day Turkey. He knows these seven churches, and they know him. And just like he's in a difficult place, so they're in a difficult place. We read in verses 9 and 10, they're patiently enduring. They're facing difficult situations and persecution for their faith in the present while living with the future hope of God's kingdom coming. And then literally, one Sunday it just happened. While he's on Patmos, he receives this vision. He starts describing it, doesn't he, in verse 10. I was in the spirit, if you like, recalling the words of the prophet Ezekiel in the way that he began his visions. And as the first few verses are keen to emphasize, this vision, notice the order how it flows. The vision comes from God. 
through Jesus, via an angel, to John, which he then passes on to these seven churches. It's a vision we're coming back to each week. It's a vision, if you like, of the risen, exalted, ascended Jesus, exercising his authority. Seen and heard, if you like, through the threefold Old Testament office of prophet, priest, and king. It's why we've got a crown there as the object to show. How do I know that? That's a good question, isn't it? Because John's vision is soaked in the scriptures of the Old Testament. You may also remember that if you were here last week, another of those three helpful things that I've learned about the book of Revelation is that to understand this book, you kind of have to understand the rest of the book. The rest of the book of the Bible, and in particular, the Old Testament. And what becomes evident the more you know your Bibles and your Old Testament is you begin to realize that John knew his Old Testament like the back of his hand. He uses hundreds and hundreds of references to the Old Testament without any direct quote. We call them allusions is the technical word. It could be a word or a phrase taken out of the Old Testament or an image that would have been so synonymous with the original hearers from the Old Testament that they knew exactly the link that John was making. Roll forward 21 centuries to Western Britain and sometimes those illusions lose their meaning. They lose their significance, which is why we need to be reminded of them or why we need to learn them. You know, in the Greek New Testament, they reckon that there is 676 illusions in this one book in 405 verses. That means there must be at least one and a half in every verse. So let me just give you an example of that, just from that first scene that we saw before you. You know, just so you can see the idea as to where I'm getting this from and not just making up. You will see on your program guide, as we've called it, a map. And then you'll see next to that map three helpful scenes. Scene one, scene two, scene three. It's where we're going this morning. And I've put there some of the Old Testament references. I'm going to give you one of them to show you this morning. My hope is that what you do is when you leave here, at some stage before next week, is you've looked at those references for yourself that you've suddenly been able to see because what is far more better for your learning, and remember, each of us is responsible for our own individual growth with God, is for you to go and look at those verses for yourself. It's so much more empowering. And so here's the one. Here's the prophet, priest, and king analogy. We see it in verse 13, if you're following, that John sees Jesus wearing this long robe with this golden sash around his chest. And some of you might be familiar with those words. Some of you might be not sure. Some of you might be a little vacant thinking, where's all that coming from? And actually, if you know the book of Exodus, John's describing the high priest's robes worn by Aaron, exactly, and others. But also, these robes are the robes worn by a prince or a king. They're the robes of royalty that we see in 1 Samuel. And then again, you may have also realized that John's words there, he's using the same robe description Daniel saw in his vision of the Son of Man, the one who came as the messenger of God. And so John is seeing Jesus as the prophet, the one who brings the truth of God. As the priest, the one who helps others enter the presence of God. And as a king, the one to whom God has given the power and dominion forever. 
You know, there are other allusions as you go on. One other one of them is how he takes the Old Testament descriptions of God and now applies them to Jesus Christ. There are others as well, so have some fun looking at them. And with that, the curtain closes for scene one. And we remember the crown always, because this is always a book about the risen, ascended Jesus. And so this time now, we open the curtain once more. And as we open the curtain once more, we find ourselves moving away from Patmos onto the mainland of modern-day Turkey. And John is instructed to write a letter to each of these seven churches. The letter would have come on something like this. It's a scroll. You know, time only allows, once again, a very brief look, which is why I put on your handout once more in your program guide, you know, a very helpful structure there to notice that how John's letter writing follows a familiar pattern. And you can see it there, you can work it out, you can plot it out. And my hope this week is that when you go from here or some stage over the next week, you'll take those references, you'll look for yourself and you'll see how it all fits together because it's so much more empowering if you do it yourself rather than have someone just do it for you. And as we come to these seven churches on the mainland, what we can see there on the map that you've got, is that they're not the only churches in that particular period, but they're the churches that John is instructed to write to. And they're the churches that were linked by a road that began in Ephesus and finished in Laodicea. That's why the structure of the letters begins from Ephesus and ends in Laodicea. So here are three thoughts to help you chew over this, uh, this morning. Firstly, that the messages are individual to the church. If we take the example of the church at Laodicea, John writes that Jesus says to the church in Laodicea, right. But these different churches were, had different contexts. They may have been relatively close located together. Some were more comfortable. Some were suffering more than others. Some had some internal conflicts about what they believed about the Christian faith and practice. So, kind of no change for churches today, really, is it? And while the messages are individual, they're not private. They're not private just to that one church. In fact, they're not private just to all of the seven churches. Let he, anyone who has an ear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. It therefore means that it's only by taking all the messages that Jesus says to the churches that we get a composite picture of what Jesus is saying to the church overall. In that way, the seven act as representative of all the churches. And so with that, the curtain closes once more on scene two. Because what I want to get us to is scene three this morning. And this church known as Laodicea. What do we know about the church of Laodicea? Well, what we probably know is that in this particular book, in this particular letter, we encounter two of the most famous verses, verses 16 and 20 in the whole of the book of Revelation. And actually two of the most misunderstood. You see, here's what every history book, religious or secular, will tell you about the church of Laodicea at that time. You know, Jesus sums it up in verse 17. They were rich, prosperous, and thought they needed nothing. You see, that's why I've got one of these. You know, Martin Fitzgerald got me this from his trip to Cambridge. A million pounds 
bank of sterling. You know, that was them. They, they, they thought they had riches, whereas actually Jesus was about to tell them that they were, in that sense, poor. And it was worthless. You know, their wealth had come from three sources. Their wealth had come from the city's location, first of all. Because where Laodicea was on that route, if you like, people traveled north and south through Laodicea. They traveled east and west through Laodicea. It became this meeting place, if you like, this junction on strategic trade routes. What therefore happened was that the money started to appear all throughout Laodicea. It became a very wealthy finance center, we could ask where lots and lots of people were making transactions, lots and lots of people were depositing money. This is how wealthy they became. About three decades before, Laodicea suffered an earthquake. And rather than asking for outside help, they rebuilt the city themselves. They were that wealthy. Also, though, the city was, was rich because it had an excellent medical hospital, particularly very, very well known in the healing of eyes and ears. And also, it was rich because its local farmers had developed a particular wool that kind of like made it a bit like the Milan of today, a fashion center as well. But as we see riches and prosperity bring many dangers, particularly for a church. Because this isn't the world that Jesus is talking about. Smugness and self-reliance, arrogance and delusion. Even to the extent that what Laodicea have done is they've kind of locked Jesus out of the building. But for all Laodicea's wealth, it had one major problem. It had no water supply. You see, it relied upon its water supply for water to come from, their ta from its taps. It relied upon its water coming from elsewhere. From six miles north at Hierapolis, and Hierapolis, they had beautiful hot springs that was very good medicinally as well. And so, for at Hierapolis, the water just flowed and it was beautiful. But by the time it got to Laodicea, the hot had changed to lukewarm of the water. And as the water came through an underground aqueduct system, the other problem was the the water had got calcified. It meant there was only one thing the lukewarm water was good for. Quite literally, vomiting. And then, later to see if you look on your maps, closest neighbor east was Colossae. We know the church at Colossae. There was a letter left, laid after it. It had excellent cold water because its water came from a different supply. And so therefore, when Jesus says in verse 16 that hot is good or cold is good, but lukewarm is good for nothing, perhaps we begin to understand what Jesus is actually saying there. You see, what he was saying was this damning indictment to the church. That Jesus, the one who we read in chapter 1, speaks like the voice of the sound of many waters, tells the Laodicean church that he's about to vomit them out of his mouth. That's what the word means. And it wasn't the state of their faith as such which made him sick, but their ineffectiveness, the lack of fruit that was produced in their lives. And so Jesus, as we read in chapter 1, the one who speaks with a sharp two-edged sword, now wields the blade slicing through the general smugness before piercing to the jugular. You think you need nothing? How wretched and pitiful you are. 
You say you're rich, well, I say you're poor. You say you're a center for excellence for eye surgery, well, I say you can't even see how blind you are. You say you're a fashion center, well, I say you're like the emperor with new clothes. And Jesus is the judge's remarks. I like this sharp, double-edged sword cutting deep to the very heart of this church that had locked him out of the midst. It's why when we come to the picture in verse 20, this very famous picture that was shown by Holman Hunt, maybe we've all seen this picture. It wasn't written to non-believers. It was written to the church that had locked Jesus out. And yet within this most, almost damning indictment of the church comes the most loving promise that if the church would change, if the church would repent, and if the church would open that door from the inside, then you have one of the most greatest promises of the hospitality and blessing of God you ever find in the whole of Scripture. And so I wonder where the Spirit might be speaking to us this morning as we close. Where might He want to encourage you or build your faith? Where might he want you to take some time this week, as I've already mentioned, looking through these references? Where might there be a, a warning for some to stop locking Jesus out of the door of your life because he's knocking? And in that remembering, the loving promise that comes with it. Shall we pray? So gracious God, we've covered much this morning. And so we just take a moment before Ken comes to lead us in our prayers to listen for your knock. To listen to where you might be speaking into our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.